All right, uh, welcome back to our EFT lecture. Uh, currently, we are discussing some features of the effective theory called LEFT, low energy EFT, which is valid below the electroweak scale. And we went through a few of interesting operators in this effective field theory, like the Majorana neutrino mass term, dipole moment operators for electric and magnetic dipole moments. And now, as the final discussion, we uh, look at dimension six operators, which are suppressed by squared masses and which contain a large class of important um, operators, which are important for many observables at low energies. Nevertheless, I will be rather brief, and then in the final part of the lecture, we will discuss similar uh, features of standard model EFT, SMEFT, but now for the dimension six level of low energy EFT. So just as an example, what kind of dimension six operators are there? One type of dimension six operators are products of three field strength tensors, because each field strength tensor is dimension two. Therefore, a product of three of them has dimension six. And uh, so you can write down Lorentz invariant combinations like this one, for example, where the indices are contracted like this. And uh, you can write this down both for the photon field and for the gluon field, uh, or even for combinations of the two. And uh, they would, of course, uh, describe processes with three gauge bosons, scattering of three gauge bosons, um, which are, however, different from the ones that are anyway present, for example, in QCD, where uh, already the square of the field strength tensor predicts the existence of quartic and triple gauge boson couplings. They would be modified by the incorporation of such dimension six operators. And another class of dimension six operators are products of four fermion fields. And uh, you can do this in a Lorentz invariant way like this, for example. And uh, there can be various types of gamma matrices between the various spinor fields, but they describe obviously processes where four fermions directly interact at one single vertex, and they are of particular importance. And, uh, Mostly now I want to discuss a few selected of those dimension six operators involving four fermions because they are particularly interesting in an obvious way, let's say. And the first uh, very important consequence of such four fermion operators is beta decay, which is obviously a well-known low energy phenomenon, which was known way, way before uh, anybody would think of effective field theories. But in the setup that we now have, uh, the natural place where beta decay must appear is exactly this low energy EFT because beta decay is a low energy phenomenon which is not part of QED plus QCD. Nevertheless, it happens at low energies. Therefore, it must be described by left correctly and uh, it must be described by higher dimensional operators and indeed it appears at the level of dimension six operators. And so here the uh, standard model diagram for beta decay would be this one where an up quark goes into a down quark with a W boson, W plus in this case. And in the final state, one would have a positron and an electron neutrino. So and you can incorporate this Feynman diagram into a proton, then it would correspond to a proton decaying into a neutron, for example, plus positron and neutrino, similar diagrams uh, which could go in, in the other direction. And this is described by an operator, namely a four fermion operator, let's call it O, um, which looks like this, um, D bar, times gamma mu p left u times um, e bar gamma mu p left nu e. Uh, actually, no, nu e bar and e, of course, otherwise charge would not be conserved. So, uh, this operator describes beta decay, 
and uh, it is a four fermion operator and you see that it directly results from replacing the W boson in this Feynman diagram by simply a factor, a numerical factor, one over MW square times G mu nu, then uh, the Feynman diagram exactly produces this expression. And so this is a four fermion operator resulting from integrating out the W boson at tree level. And here you have this structure, psi bar, psi, psi bar, psi, but in between the spin was you have gamma mu times P left and another one gamma mu times P left in both cases. The spinor indices are saturated uh, first of all here and then once again here as well and the Lorentz indices are saturated by this contraction. So this is a typical four fermion operator with an obvious, um, uh, obvious interpretation and in the effective field theory it would appear with a coefficient c and uh, what is the value of the coefficient c in the standard model? Can you um, see what is the correct value resulting from actually integrating out the w in the standard model? Basically it is obtained by taking the diagram and replacing the w propagator by just one over the mass square, neglecting the momentum. Right, so E square over SW square times MW square, or that is the same as the weak gauge coupling GW square divided by MW square. And on the other hand, that is also the same simply as one over V square. So we get a very simple value for the coefficient. And Last time, we often compared our explicit results with very naive or semi-naive expectations. And here, this is totally in line with the most naive possible expectation of a coefficient. Namely, we say that the EFT is valid below the electroweak scale. Therefore, all Wilson coefficients naturally get a mass suppression, one over V to the appropriate power. And here the Wilson coefficient exactly is given by one over V square to the appropriate power. So this is fully in line with the simplest possible expectation. So we can say that beta decay is uh, explicitly generated by dimension six operators with um, completely generic prefactor, so no additional secret symmetries are at play to give some extra features, extra numerical factors, uh, which we wouldn't obtain in a naive way. So that is interesting. Next, a very important observable is mu1 decay. So the appropriate Feynman diagram in the standard model is this one. essentially the same and so here you would get an operator O uh, which is essentially the same. Nu bar gamma mu p left mu times nu sorry uh, e bar gamma mu p left nu e and the coefficient is essentially the same. So also mu on decay is governed by dimension six operators with a completely generic value in the prefect world. Next, interesting are B decays of the B quark, which is something that is uh, studied very extensively at recent experiments. And we had this also in the exercise. So B quark can decay into charm quark via W boson. And then in the final state, you can have, for example, also down quark and up quark, like this. And again, this is similar. So 
both the operator and the coefficient are obviously obtained in a similar way. And we looked at the precise operator in the exercise, even including one loop corrections where we encountered operator mixing in a two by two matrix sense because QCD mixes the uh, operator which is naively obtained with another one with different color structure. So all of these decays here are weak decays which are mediated by the W boson and in each of the cases we obtain operators and coefficients which are completely governed by naive expectations. And so let me just uh, point out that the common feature of all these decays is that there are essentially no flavor changes uh, except for here from bottom to charm which is governed in the standard model by the CKM matrix element VCB between the second and the third generation and this CKM matrix element would suppress this decay somewhat but not dramatically so because the CKM matrix element is not very small. So, so far we looked at weak decays without um, rare flavor decays. So let us, uh, to finish the discussion, look at two examples of decays which are rare and where the Wilson coefficients are much smaller than you might naively expect and uh, point out the reasons why the smallness arises. So the first one is charged lepton flavor violation. So we had already an example of charged lepton flavor violation last time where we looked at mu 2 e gamma. Mu 2 e gamma is a process which is mediated by a dipole operator of dimension five and our super naive expectation was suppression like one over V which was violated by uh, many, many, many orders of magnitude, maybe 15 to 20 orders of magnitude. Uh, but now let us look at a different, also very interesting lepton flavor violating observable, namely this one um, as an example. Suppose you have here a nucleus and in the nucleus, you, um, it's part of an atom, but in the atom, you replace an electron by a muon. Then you have a muonic atom. The muon is bound and circles around the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, there is an up quark. And then we are some Feynman diagram. Maybe a muon plus up quark goes into electron plus up quark. Then what you see from the outside is that in your muonic atom, simply the muon suddenly spontaneously decays into an electron, but there is no other final state except for the electron plus the nucleus. And uh, momentum conservation is possible by the entire nucleus of the atom getting some recoil. So that is an interesting observable, mu to E conversion in the presence of a nucleus. One way this could happen is via mu 2 e gamma. If mu 2 e gamma exists, like we uh, speculated last time, then mu 2 e gamma, the gamma could be absorbed by the nucleus and you have this mu 2 e conversion. But the photon would then be virtual and you cannot see it experimentally, but it's absorbed by the nucleus, which then gets a recoil. But uh, there may be some completely different Feynman diagrams uh, which directly produce only mu to e uh, in the presence of an up quark, but not mu to e gamma. And then this would be governed by a dimension six operator, for example, this one, O, um, let's say, E bar gamma mu mu times U bar gamma mu u. So this is just a four fermion operator which produces exactly this process and uh, experiments are searching for this and uh, there are actually two experiments under construction worldwide which aim to improve the sensitivity to such a process by uh, 
several orders of magnitude, in fact, so very impressive experimental efforts. Uh, therefore, we discuss it, and uh, the point is that this operator in the process violates lepton number. Again, so lepton number uh, is not conserved individually for every generation. So, um, let's say this violates lepton flavor or lepton family number, if you want, where you would assign the um, muon lepton number, uh, electron lepton number, and tau lepton number, and uh, you start out with one muon, and you end up with zero muons, but with one electron. So the electron number and the muon number is violated by one unit each by this process, and the standard model predicts no such processes, therefore in the standard model it is zero, but if the standard model is not the ultimate truth, maybe some physics beyond the standard model might give rise to such a decay. That is why one looks for it, and, uh, but so far one hasn't seen it. So, and of course, um, the fact that we haven't seen it means that if the process exists, it uh, must have a very small Wilson coefficient, and that means, again, that lepton flavor number is a very good symmetry of nature. Maybe an exact symmetry, but if it is broken, it is broken by extremely small effects. So far, never seen experimentally. And you could quantify how small the Wilson coefficient has to be compared to the naive expectation and uh, the result would be similar to uh, what we have done last time for mu 2 gamma, where we had uh, 13 orders of magnitude uh, stronger suppression than naively expected, and the numbers would be similar here. Then finally, let us look at proton decay. How would a proton decay operator look like? There are many uh, ways the proton can decay, um, uh, uh, at least conceivably, described by many different types of operators. So this is just one example, and the example I selected is this one, epsilon, alpha, beta, gamma, times the following, DL, charge conjugated with color index alpha, bar, times U color index beta, left times u left charge conjugated color index gamma bar times e left. Okay. So you see an operator which has one lepton field, namely the electron field, and three quark fields up, up, down. And uh, it is color neutral because you have here three color indices, alpha, beta, gamma, contracted with a totally anti-symmetric epsilon tensor, and you can check for yourself, or you did it in some standard model lecture, that uh, such a combination is indeed SU3 gauge invariant. And, okay, then you see here up quark, um, down quark, twice complex conjugated essentially, so up quark, down quark, down quark, uh, gives together, uh, or sorry, up quark gives together a proton. So this would de directly describe a process where the proton decays. You start out with up quark, up quark, down quark, which together are a proton. But this operator is a direct vertex where the three of them annihilate and produce together a positron. So it's a decay. Um, three quarks into a positron, and in order to have momentum conservation, maybe you should emit also a photon. Positron. So, this has also never been observed. Even though several experiments have looked for it, and therefore, we can derive a limit on the Wilson coefficient. So, must be at most of the order, say, one over m gut square, where 
M got is at least as large as about 10 to the 16 GeV. So this is the suppression the Wilson coefficient must have to have in order not to violate agreement with experiment. And that means, of course, that uh, this is also way smaller than you might naively expect, which tells you that if there is new physics which violates baryon or lepton number and which makes the proton decay, then this physics is either extremely um, symmetric with respect to baryon number or it lives at ultra high scales like 10 to the 16 GeV or more. So maybe I should reiterate that in different words. If you have new physics uh, whose gen, uh, let's say intrinsic mass scale is as large as that one, then this new physics could violate baryon number uh, in an unconstrained way, in other words, with order one coefficients, because then it would produce such a proton decay operator with order one coefficient, but times one over the intrinsic mass scale, which is one over 10 to the 16 GeV square, and that is small enough. So physics at that high scales could violate baryon number conservation without any constraints. And that is the case in grand unified theories. But if you have new physics which lives at lower scales, then this cannot violate baryon number without any constraints. It must feel uh, baryon number as a good symmetry um, of the interactions of that new physics. So these are lessons that you can draw from analyzing the EFT predictions in, in this kind of way. Okay, and with this, I would like to finish our discussion of left. This is, of course, just a first introduction to the way of thinking and uh, gives you some illustration what you can do with the theory. And uh, then I would move on and uh, do a similar discussion for SMEFT, the other effective field theory which goes beyond the standard model. Do you have any questions to this? Yep. According to the operator, not, because here you have up quark, and up quark charge conjugated end part is again an up quark, and here also down quark charge conjugated end part is again a down quark. So up quark, up quark, down quark, like here, all in the same direction. I mean, uh, honestly speaking, maybe the entire operator should be um, plus Hermitian conjugated because that would correspond, uh, no, actually it is correct as it stands. It corresponds to an incoming up quark, incoming up quark, incoming down quark, and that corresponds to either an incoming electron or an outgoing positron. So it corresponds exactly to this operator. So lepton number overall, independent of generation, is definitely um, even, let's say, a better symmetry than lepton flavor number. So because lepton flavor number is already broken by the neutrino masses, we know that. We know the neutrino masses um, are non-zero, and we know that neutrinos do oscillation. Therefore, the uh, lepton flavor number is definitely not a conserved quantum number in nature but the violation is extremely weak and so far we have only seen it in terms of neutrino oscillations, which are of course very weak because it takes uh, light years and so, okay, or kilometers depending on the energy uh, to oscillate. Um, and if you would use the neutrino oscillations to generate such a process, you could do it by muon emits a muon neutrino which oscillates into an electron neutrino and then the electron neutrino gets into an electron, you definitely would have such Feynman diagrams and they would be non-zero, but if you evaluate them just from the known neutrino masses, the result is absolutely tiny and uh, even way, way tinier than the experimental limits of 10 to the minus 13 that we discussed last, last time. So compared to the 10 to the minus 13, the Feynman diagrams from neutrino oscillation would give you 10 to the minus 50 or so. So 40 orders of magnitude smaller, approximately. 
Um, but anyway, we know that this exists, and so lepton flavor number is definitely broken, but we have never seen at all any process violating lepton number conservation. So and this would violate lepton number conservation entirely, not only flavor number, and it also would violate barrier number conservation, and we have seen neither. And uh, as for the proton decay, the proton could decay like this into a lepton. In this case, um, let's say the sum of baryon plus lepton number would be conserved. You could also have proton decay uh, where in the final state there is uh, zero leptons. Then only baryon number would be violated, but lepton number would be conserved. Or you could produce, I don't know, uh, some neutrinos and antineutrinos in the final state, then maybe um, baryon number minus lepton number, no, oh, what is it? Here, baryon minus lepton number is, I think, conserved because, is it baryon minus lepton number? No, baryon, yes, baryon minus lepton number is conserved. You could also have the opposite where baryon plus lepton number is conserved if I put some neutrinos into the final state. But the proton could, for example, also decay into pi plus, plus photon. Then in the final state, you have zero leptons. Then just barrier number would be violated, and so on. So there are various possibilities, uh, but we have seen neither of them. But it is an interesting discussion about this baryon and lepton number because it also is related to the phenomenon of anomalies in quantum field theories where the standard model uh, predicts certain uh, symmetries related to baryon and lepton number to have an anomaly, in other words, a breaking by loop effects which could be visible in um, non-perturbative effects. But uh, even though these effects are there in the standard model, they do not lead to a prediction of proton decay at any measurable rates. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, we should maybe try to cover a little bit of SMEFT as well. So let me say that this then 7.5 some features of Smith and let me just clean the blackboard. Okay, let us again begin with the definition. The energy scale is of course above the weak scale. So we want our theory to be valid above the weak scale and for that of course it contains the standard model because the standard model is valid at the weak scale. But we do not know how far above the weak scale the standard model remains valid and SMEFT would be a theory which improves the standard model and extends the validity to higher scales. So the particles, fields, and also the gauge invariance is equal to the one of the standard model. And the power counting is then proportional to momenta or masses divided by some heavy scale lambda, which is much bigger than the weak scale of some hypothetical new physics. Okay. And we do not know how large this lambda might be but uh, clearly it uh, should be significantly heavier than the electroweak scale, otherwise the EFT approach, which is a Taylor expansion in these powers, uh, would not make sense. So the basic assumption that goes into this setup is that there may be new physics 
but new physics of a special kind, namely new physics which does not involve new light particles or new um, symmetries which uh, would affect the low energy physics, and by low I mean everything at the weak scale or lower, um, and uh, which allows this power counting. So it must be compatible with the standard model gauge invariance. And there are no light, where light means of the order of the electroweak scale or below particles. With this assumption, we can sketch the Lagrangian L, which is then first of all the Lagrangian of the standard model itself. And then, of course, of additional terms, which are combinations of the standard model particles or fields with the standard model gauge invariance, but uh, not necessarily renormalizable terms we now allow higher dimensional operators. Now in the case of this left low energy EFT, there was even additional dimension three operators. Can there be additional dimension three operators in this case? No, there cannot, because the standard model is already the most general Lagrangian that you can write down of, out of the standard model fields, uh, which is dimension four or less. So everything which is possible is already incorporated here. That was not the case with QED and QCD. Um, so we only have higher dimensional operators, let's say L5, L6, plus, and so on. So let's just add here this comment by definition. This is the most general gauge invariant Lagrangian with dimension up to four terms. Whereas in QED plus QCD, the neutrino mass term was missing because it's by definition not a part of QED and QCD. All right. So this is our definition, and now let us walk again through some interesting aspects of this. And uh, how much time do we have? Yeah. Um, who attended my electro -week lecture in the last semester? Actually, I think last summer semester. Not everybody. Nevertheless, I will now refer to it, because I think it is um, a useful thing to have in mind. So these are the only comments I will make on the dimension four level. Of course, uh, this contains the actual standard model and so everything that can be said about the standard model could now be said, but we will not do that. But what I will say is that the standard model has some interesting and surprising properties which you do not expect if you just write down its definition. I call these miracles. The standard model contains several so-called, or from me, by me, so-called miracles, which are interesting and peculiar properties the standard model possesses, which follow from its definition, but which are not part of the definition, and which all of, all of which are not really obvious. So in a way, you might call them accidental consequences. Of the combination of the field content plus gauge invariance plus renormalizability. 
renormalizability means that we only allow dimension up to four operators in the Lagrangian. That is the meaning of renormalizability. And uh, so you yeah, allow only gauge invariant terms with a particular set of quantum fields and uh, only up to dimension four. And then you collect everything that you can write down and write it down into the standard model Lagrangian. And by this combination of requirements, some things just do not happen, okay? Which might happen if you release some of those requirements. And let us walk through the miracles that I um, explained in the lecture last year. So this was, let's say, see the electro week theory lecture from 2023. That was basically done in sections one and two of this lecture. I think there was a summary at the end of section two of that lecture that you can look at. And uh, let me list them. One is baryon plus lepton number conservation. Okay. It is just impossible to write down any operator, any term into the Lagrangian where baryon number is violated, even though baryon number conservation is not part of the definition of the standard model. And I've just a minute ago written down a proton decay operator. This is gauge invariant. It contains only the standard model fields, but it is of dimension six. That means this follows from the restriction to renormalizable terms. Otherwise, baryon and lepton number would be allowed. If you have other fields in your theory, for example, in a supersymmetric theory, there are superpartners, two quarks and leptons, there's quarks and leptons. If you have those, you can write down baryon and lepton number violating terms which are renormalizable. So that means it is the combination of the field content, gauge invariance, of course, and renormalizability, which just happens to forbid baryon and lepton number conservation in the standard model. It is a miracle, and this miracle is not shared by many alternatives to the standard model. So that is point number one. Another thing, automatic SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge spontaneous symmetry breaking. So if you spontaneously break the symmetry by giving the Higgs a Mexican head potential such that the Higgs gets a vacuum expectation value, then the remaining symmetry after the Higgs gets its wave is automatically U1 corresponding to electric charge such that exactly the photon which couples to electric charge remains massless, whereas all the other gauge bosons become massive. This follows from the fact that we have one Higgs doublet, and it is a doublet, and uh, not anything else, and not two doublets, or three doublets, or triplets, or whatever. With this single doublet, it is an automatic consequence that there can only be a U1 symmetry and there must be a U1 symmetry still present in the vacuum, no matter how strange the Higgs chooses its minimum in the Mexican head potential, or you cannot modify the Mexican head potential such that ultimately the Higgs gets a vacuum expectation which would give mass to the photon. That is just impossible from the structure of the scalar field and from the structure of the potential. And again, this is different. For example, if you have the two Higgs doublet model, one of the favorite ideas for physics beyond the standard model, where you simply have more than one Higgs in the theory, more complicated Mexican head potential structure, and then it could easily happen that the photon becomes massive. Or in some other theories, for example, Higgs triplet, it might easily happen that the re remaining symmetry of the vacuum is such that you have two massless gauge bosons instead of one. So in general, theories which just uh, do electroweak symmetry breaking, they could end up with zero massless gauge bosons, one massless gauge boson, two massless gauge bosons. Nature has one, 
and the standard model can only do one. So that is, again, a miracle. And by the way, I forgot to stress, the miracles also agree with experiment. Okay? So nature shares these properties which are miraculously predicted by the standard model. And uh, the uh, implication of the discussion that we are having at the moment is that the standard model is better than it looks because it miraculously predicts a lot of things which are observed in nature and which are not predicted by alternatives to the standard model. So the third miracle is uh, the so-called rho parameter. Rho 3 is equal to 1. And uh, let me not explain in detail what the row parameter is in general, but what I technically mean is that the ratio between the two masses, mw divided by mz, this is equal to the cosine of the weak mixing angle. If you define the cosine of the weak mixing angle in terms of the gauge coupling constants, gw divided by square root of gw square plus gy square. So actually, the main equality is the one between the masses and the gauge couplings. And now, because of this equality, there are different ways how you can define the weak mixing angle. Some people define it via the mass ratio. Some people define it via the ratio of gauge coupling constants. But the non-trivial fact is that this ratio is equal to that ratio. That is a prediction of the standard model at three level. And of course, it's uh, not a prediction at a higher order level, but it's a prediction at three level. And let me be a little bit more technical in this case. Uh, namely, what it means is that at three level, you have a mass matrix for the gauge bosons. Let's say in the basis W1, W2, W3, B. So these are the SU2 cross U1 gauge bosons. There are three SU2 gauge fields, W1 to 3, and a U1 gauge field B, which then mix to give the W plus, W minus, Z, and photon. But in this basis, there is first of all a mass matrix, which is a four by four matrix. And the eigenvalues of that matrix would then be the physical masses of the physical gauge bosons. But in that basis, how does the mass matrix look like? It looks as follows. Uh, proportional to GW square times V square. V is the Higgs vacuum expectation value. Then here, GW square times V square, GW square times V square in the diagonal elements. And then there is a block matrix here, GW times GY for hypercharge times V square, GY times GW times V square and gy square times v square. That is the mass matrix. Okay. And first of all, you see maybe immediately uh, what are the eigenvalues. First of all, these two lines here are proportional to each other because if you multiply one with gw divided by gy, then you get the other one. So they are linearly dependent. Therefore, one eigenvalue is zero. So it's a zero determinant. One eigenvalue is zero, which means the photon remains massless. On the other hand, some combination of them give mass to the Z boson, and the mass is then GW square plus GY square times V square, which is the Z mass. And here, that obviously gives mass to the W with eigenvalue GW square times V square. And then you see the ratio of the masses, one mass with GW square, the other mass with GW square plus GY square, which gives exactly this mass ratio. Now, um, you see that the relationship between the two masses, um, gauge coupling ratio related to mass ratio, comes from this correlation here. This entry of the mass matrix is a relationship between the W mass, because this entry is the same as the entry for the W mass, but it is part of the mass matrix which gives the Z mass. And because of this matrix element, there is this relationship between the masses. So basically, the non-trivial symmetry of the standard model 
is that here there is a unit matrix, part of the 4x4 mass matrix, namely a 3x3 three three unit matrix, uh, where all three entries here are equal. And this equality is just a property of the standard model, which is, again, a miracle. And uh, this property is not true in extensions of the standard model. And if this relationship uh, would be violated such that here you have a different entry than those ones, then that mass relationship is not true. And again, this can happen in many extensions of the standard model. For example, in our group, some people work with the so-called MR SSM, uh, where there is a Higgs triplet. And if you have a Higgs triplet, then the Higgs triplet would give uh, different entries uh, to these three um, different values to the three entries. So there is an equality between these three entries here, and this equality between the three entries corresponds to an SO3 symmetry or SU2 symmetry. So the standard model possesses an SU2 symmetry in the vacuum. The vacuum of the standard model has a remaining SU2 symmetry, which has a name, it is the so-called SU2 custodial symmetry. So, before we said that the remaining symmetry of the vacuum in the standard model is U1 gauge invariance, which gives rise to a massless photon. But actually, we discover now that the standard model has an even bigger symmetry in the vacuum, namely this SU2 custodial symmetry. And this gives rise to the equality and therefore to the mass ratio between the W and the Z. And this custodial symmetry is not so well known because it is not part of the gauge symmetry. It is a so-called global symmetry. Uh, no gauge bosons coupled to it. Therefore, it is not part of the definition of the standard model. But it is an accidental global symmetry which is present. And it is also not an exact symmetry because it is violated by higher order effects. But at three level, it is a symmetry of the standard model vacuum. And it has this important consequence. And again, extensions of the standard model can violate it like the MRSSM. But uh, this agrees with experiments, so it's again a miracle where the standard model performs better than you would could hope for, you know. You also have to imagine and uh, to recall that the standard model was defined and set up like it is in the early 1970s, where none of this had been measured. And all the confirmations of these miraculous predictions came later. So you could not really assume in the beginning that any of those predictions would turn out to be correct. Uh, okay, maybe except for those two. But this, for sure not. Okay, the next. There are no three-level flavor-changing neutral currents. And there are, in fact, three suppression mechanisms. For flavor-changing neutral currents, um, without going into details, First of all, flavor changing neutral currents like B2S gamma, for example, where you change bottom to strange. This is a flavor changing neutral current. Uh, they are three times suppressed by three different, um, let's say, mechanisms. The first one is at three level, they are zero, so they are arising at loop order. Therefore, they are suppressed by loop factors 1 over 16 pi square. But then uh, they are mediated by products of CKM matrix elements products of CKM matrix elements with different generations happen to be small because the off-diagonal CKM entries are small, but that is a phenomenological observation. Wouldn't have to be like this, but it is like that. And then there is a third mechanism, the so-called GIM mechanism or a GIM mechanism, which means that if the masses of the various quarks would be the same, then also the flavor changing neutral currents would go to zero. Therefore, uh, they are governed only by mass splittings between quarks. 
and the mass splittings, at least in the first two generations, are very small as well. Therefore, this is a third suppression mechanism. And the combination of the three mechanisms on top of each other mean that flavor chain tree neutral currents are super rare. And that, again, is in agreement with experiment. However, if you look at extensions of the standard model, like dimension six operators, then you could write down a flavor chain tree neutral current dimension six operator. Uh, with no suppression at all, and uh, that would totally violate experimental observation. And again, supersymmetric theories or two Higgs doublet model are examples of theories where you can write down on the renormalizable level, dimension four, terms which uh, directly violate this flavor changing neutral currents uh, at three level without any suppression. And then, I mean, such models would lack the three times uh, suppression mechanism that is present in the standard model and which agrees with measurements. So again, the standard model also here is much better than you should hope for. Next, there is a single parameter for CP violation. Actually, that is not exactly true. That is only true if we ignore uh, the so-called theta terms. But we ignored them already before, so let's continue to ignore them here. Then there is only a single parameter for CP violation in the standard model, which is part of the CKM matrix. And that means that all CP violation uh, that you ever observe is governed by just one single parameter. Once you measure one CP violating process, and calculate the value of that parameter, you can predict every other CP violating process unambiguously, and it agrees with the experiment. And needless to say, also this is different in extensions of the standard model where you can have dimension four operators which violate CP directly even uh, in processes which have nothing to do with quark flavor, but in the standard model, CP can only be violated in the quark flavor sector because it's related to the CKM matrix. So uh, the next point and the last one is that the standard model contains no neutrino masses, and that is maybe the only miracle which is not confirmed experimentally because there are neutrino masses. Okay, and let me now simply say that higher dimensional operators can of course violate all of this. And it is particularly interesting to experimentally study processes which are sensitive to those miracles because there maybe you expect particularly strong deviations from the standard model since in general, uh, generic theories do not possess any of those properties. Okay. And uh, so this kind of discussion has guided uh, the selection of examples that I now wanted to discuss with you because the most examples will violate some of those properties here such that you can see how corresponding operators would look like. So, what is the biggest effect from physics beyond the standard model that you could naively expect at all? Thinking, uh, after you have now witnessed one semester of thinking about effective field theories, you should now maybe have an intuition what is the biggest new physics effect beyond the standard model that you could possibly imagine or that is most plausible to be discovered first experimentally? No. Basically, I would expect uh, some low energy decay process or something like that to be observed or to be the first thing observed. Why that? Simply by just saying that we will um, have 
much more observational data on the OMG processes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe that could be first, but actually that's I mean, first of all, you have uh, your argument goes in line with the uh, SMEFT idea, standard model EFT idea, namely you say, uh, let us not hope for the direct discovery of new particles. Let us uh, consider standard model processes, processes of known particles, but let us look for deviations from the standard model prediction. And then those deviations would be described by higher dimensional operators, right? So if there is a deviation in this setup, it must be describable by higher dimensional operators in SMEFT. But now uh, the EFT logic gives you some hierarchy of effects. Some effects are very small, some effects are bigger. And what is the most naive hierarchy that we have at our disposal? It is the power counting of the EFT. So the EFT contains operators of dimension 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and so on. But what could be the biggest effect? Obviously dimension 5. Yes, exactly. So the most obvious expectation would be that the first deviation from the standard model happens in processes which are sensitive to dimension 5 operators. Therefore, a very interesting question would be, what are those processes? And what are the dimension five operators because they have the weakest suppression? And uh, so, therefore, let us study the dimension five level. And immediately state this, the EFT logic would tell you that uh, this as plausibly the largest observable effect of physics beyond the standard model. Of course, there is no guarantee for that because we have already seen that EFT operators could have an extra suppression, for example, by chiral symmetry or by lepton flavor symmetry. We don't know about that, but in principle, if we know nothing else, we only know power counting and that we know for sure. Therefore, it is possible that this is the first thing we should look at. And now you should be very curious, what are those dimension five operators? And the interesting thing is, there is exactly one single dimension five operator or one class of dimension five operator and therefore only one single effect which can result from them. And what is this effect? You have all heard about it, namely we discussed it already and it is neutrino masses. The only operator which exists at the dimension five operator gives rise to neutrino masses. And therefore the existence of neutrino masses does not come as a surprise if you have this in mind. So we have already observed the first effect from SMEFT, maybe. So there is just one single kind of dimension five operator, namely Majorana mass terms for neutrinos. But now, wait, you might say, uh, hey, last time we said Majorana mass terms have dimension three. In left, they had dimension three, but now they have dimension five. What has happened? What has happened is electroweak gauge invariance. Now the Majorana mass terms must be SU2 cross U1 gauge invariant. They didn't have to be gauge invariant the last time. And therefore the neutrino mass operator is very complicated actually and it involves the Higgs boson. It looks as follows. So some Wilson coefficient C neutrino mass times the following um, L charge conjugated bar times this Higgs twiggle dagger field times again Higgs twiggle dagger times uh, the lepton doublet. So this is the lepton SU2 doublet.
this is this uh, version of the Higgs field where you basically exchange the upper and lower component with an epsilon tensor. This is still an SU2 doublet, but with reversed hypercharge. And uh, if you reverse the hypercharge and look at this particular product, then this is invariant under SU2 and under hypercharge. SU2 invariance is easy to see because that is a Decker doublet times a doublet is SU2 invariant, here the same. But the hypercharges of the lepton and uh, the Higgs are opposite. So if you would do Higgs Decker times lepton doublet, hypercharge would not be conserved, but if you do Higgs tilde Decker times lepton, then it is invariant under hypercharge as well. And so this is totally gauge invariant. And if you replace this Higgs tilde by the vacuum expectation value, which is now in the upper component, then you get here just the neutrino field and here as well. So you get the coefficient times V square times the product of two neutrino fields, one charge conjugated neutrino times a neutrino, which is a Majorana neutrino mass term, but multiplied with Higgs vacuum expectation value. So the logic of the uh, SMEFT effective theory would uh, say that it is plausible to expect this term as maybe the first consequence of a new physics theory. And indeed, we see neutrino masses, but we do not yet know whether the neutrino masses are Majorana or Dirac masses. Therefore, it is not known whether this is the correct mechanism to explain neutrino masses, but it is an extremely plausible mechanism to explain neutrino masses. And again, for this reason also, it is extremely important to figure out whether or not the neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana particles. Because if they are Dirac, then maybe this is excluded. Otherwise, uh, this is confirmed. So, so far, unknown. Whether this is the correct description of neutrino masses, but it could be. Anyway, the operator gives rise to Majorana neutrino masses and Majorana neutrino mass terms in general and also this operator in particular violate overall lepton number conservation. Delta L is plus minus two governed by this operator. So you start with two neutrinos and end with nothing. So you violate lepton number conservation. And uh, so this operator implies in particular neutrino less double beta decay. So let us write down a Feynman diagram for this. For example, down quark, up quark, down quark, up quark. So you have two down quarks which decay into an up quark, or you could have part of neutron, two neutrons which decay into two protons. And each does basically a beta decay. So here you have a W boson. And uh, beta decay normally means that you get here in the final state an electron and a neutrino. And here also in the final state, electron and neutrino. And normal beta decay is simply down quark goes into up quark plus electron and uh, anti-neutrino. You have this twice. This is a double beta decay. But if you have now a Majorana mass term for the neutrinos, then you can basically close the Feynman diagram in this way. And the two anti-neutrinos annihilate each other. So they do not appear at all in the final state of the process but they just appear as virtual particles. And in the final state, you only have two electrons, but zero neutrinos. And then you have neutrino less double beta decay. And that is only possible if overall lepton number 
is violated by plus minus two units, as you see here in this process. So this is governed by this Majorana mass term. It is therefore a firm prediction um, of uh, the theory if neutrino masses are described in this way. And that is why people search for this. So searches are ongoing. Okay, any questions to this? So you know that here, for example, there is the legend experiment, which several of our institute participate in. And this is exactly uh, an experiment searching for this neutrino less double beta decay. So that would be a tremendous milestone of particle physics if the nature of neutrinos, Majorana or Dirac could be clarified. So now in the remaining time, I think we have uh, mainly examples for most of these miracles in the standard model, basically showing you how operators look like that violate one or the other property of the standard model, such that you have something in mind. Possibly time is not enough to cover all the aspects. Is there something particular you want to see? Anybody? some requests, otherwise we would do it chronologically. Okay, if there are no requests, then let me do it chronologically. And let me begin with dipole operators. So dipole operators are now of dimension six instead of dimension five because they again must be electroweak gauge invariant. And uh, just because of the particular field content of the standard model, there is no dimension five dipole operator possible. But that is again a peculiar feature of the particular selection of singlet and doublet fields which we happen to have in the standard model. So a dipole operator can now be written like this. C dipole times, for example, a left-handed lepton doublet L bar times sigma mu nu times a gauge group generator TA times a right-handed lepton singlet ER times a Higgs doublet times a field strength tensor FA mu nu. And so you see here that a dipole operator necessarily connects a right-handed and a left-handed spinor. The right-handed spinors that we have are, however, singlets, all of them, and the left-handed fields are doublets. So that is, this product can therefore never be gauge invariant in the standard model. We need to multiply it with another doublet, which can only be the Higgs. Therefore, the Higgs makes an appearance um, unnecessarily in principle for a dipole operator, but here necessary for gauge invariance. And then we multiply with the field strength tensor. And again, because of gauge invariance, the field strength tensors have an SU2 or U1 gauge group index, and they must be connected here with correct generators of the SU2 gauge group, for example. Then this is a dipole operator, and once you replace this by the vacuum expectation value, then in this case, for example, that would project out of the lepton field just the electron component and the neutrino component drops out. It would be multiplied by zero, so the doublet vacuum expectation value would look like this. So the neutrino is projected to zero, and then you would simply get left-handed electron bar sigma mu nu, right-handed electron times f mu nu times the vacuum expectation value. So this is what you would obtain. And in this way, you really get a normal um, dipole operator for electric and magnetic dipole moments of the charged leptons. And similarly, you can do it for the quarks. So what is therefore the prediction for G minus two of the muon as an example? So it would be proportional to 
the muon mass that comes always from the definition. And uh, in the dimension five case, we simply had muon mass times the dimension five operator coefficient. But now our operator coefficient is the vacuum expectation value times this dipole coefficient. So times V times the real part of the dipole coefficient. And the dipole coefficient is now one over M square instead of one over M. Therefore the units match. And you see here that we have a different expectation than in the low energy EFT. In the left theory, uh, we had the super naive expectation that we simply get, let's say, let me write it once again, in left, we had m mu divided by v. That was our super naive expectation, which wa was, however, wrong. And if we update the prediction with chiral symmetry, we got that. which was in agreement. Now in SMEFT, we have a different expectation. And the expectation is different because we now assume that our new physics uh, is valid above the electroweak scale where the W boson and the Z boson are already known. Therefore, new physics has different properties, assumed different properties, no new particles. But the gauge invariance SU2 cross U1 is completely intact in our new physics. And then our naive expectation would be um, muon mass times V divided by lambda square, where lambda is the scale of new physics. And then we have not used uh, anything about this chiral symmetry. But if we update the prediction with chiral symmetry, then uh, we would say uh, the coefficient must be suppressed by the Yukawa coupling of the muon because chiral symmetry is violated weakly in this assumption only by the value of the Yukawa coupling. So then there would be an additional factor of the Yukawa coupling. V times the Yukawa coupling gives the muon mass. Then our prediction would be a mu square divided by lambda square. So these are the different expectations following from different assumptions about new physics. Here in the left case, new physics basically contains the W and Z bosons. W and Z physics is new compared to left. And the W and Z contribution totally agrees with this exact prediction or with this exact expectation. Now here, we know already about the W and Z, and we assume new physics like supersymmetry or two Higgs doublet model or something like that, or lepto quarks and so on. And then if uh, the new physics preserves chiral symmetry, we expect this order of magnitude. If the new physics does not care about chiral symmetry, we might expect even this order of magnitude. And let me simply say, often concrete BSM scenarios do not completely ignore chiral symmetry. But they also do not completely follow it, but they have chiral enhancements. such that you get essentially this expectation with chiral symmetry, but with an additional enhancement factor like times 10 or times 20, something like this. And in some particular models that we might look at, like vector-like leptons or leptoquarks, sometimes the chiral symmetry can be completely ignored. And then we would end up with such a prediction which is only viable if the mass scale is high enough. OK, so this is an interesting discussion that one could, of course, deepen. But just as an illustration, let's leave it at that. Let me then show you a violation of custodial symmetry.
So a violation of custodial symmetry, and uh, it is interesting to read on that. There is a lecture notes by a skipper with the following number, 10.06.2142. And he explains this uh, nicely with way more details than I can now do in five minutes. And uh, he defines an operator OT. T stands for the so-called T parameter, which is an important or, let's say, well-known concept. And uh, the operator looks like this. H decker covariant derivative H and the whole thing squared. So H decker covariant derivative H is um, gauge covariant, but not Lorentz invariant and of dimension three. And if you square it, it also becomes Lorentz invariant and dimension six. Now, without going into any more details, but let us look um, how does this operator contribute to the W and Z masses? Do you know how this operator contributes to the W and Z masses? So since it contains a covariant derivative, it contains the gauge bosons. And if you replace the Higgs by the vacuum expectation value, then uh, there are lots of constant terms times gauge bosons, which are mass terms for the gauge bosons. So let us evaluate this square. So H decker becomes zero V and H becomes zero V. And the covariant derivative becomes what? The covariant derivative, first of all, the ordinary derivative does not contribute if it acts onto a constant. So we can forget about the ordinary derivative, that we have only the term plus i times the gauge coupling. There is i times GW times the Pauli matrices, sigma a over two times w a mu. A runs from one to three, and these are the generators of the SU2 gauge group acting on doublets. These are the gauge bosons W1, 2, 3, corresponding to SU2 gauge invariants. And then we have plus I times GY times the hypercharge times B mu, where B mu stands for the U1 gauge field for hypercharge, hypercharge generator, and the gauge coupling for hypercharge. Now, um, all of this gives uh, V square, vacuum expectation value square, times gauge coupling square, times gauge boson square. So in principle, it is clear we get terms of the form of gauge boson masses. Square of these fields times V square times some prefactor. But which gauge bosons actually appear in the relation? Because you contract from the left with zero V and from the right with zero V. And here you have a matrix, two by two matrix. So, and you sum over the indices one, two, three. And then you have here the Pauli matrix, sigma one, sigma two, or sigma three, between zero V, zero V. For example, sigma one looks like this. Exactly. So only the uh, component here matters, and the only Pauli matrix which has something there is sigma three. So, in other words, only. A equals three contributes. And the B mu, does it contribute? It contributes. And so therefore, this gives only something to a combination, namely, to which combination uh, do we get? We get the following, GW times minus one half W3, plus GY times plus one half B. 
this combination appears squared, you know. So the entry is minus one half, the three three entry of the respective Pauli matrix. The hypercharge is plus one half of the Higgs doublet. And so you get exactly this linear combination which appears with a square. And this linear combination, of course, is nothing but the Z boson field with some prefactor. And therefore, from this term, we get precisely an additional mass term for the Z. We do not get anything for the photon, and we do not get anything for the W boson. So this increases only MZ, but not MW. And therefore, with this term, MW over MZ is different from GY G W over square root GW square plus GY square. So this relationship, which was a miraculous consequence of the standard model, is violated if this term has a non-zero coefficient. And since uh, that relationship, however, is experimentally very well confirmed, it gives, of course, a constraint on how large the coefficient here can be. But this is clearly an interesting thing because experiments are very strongly searching for deviations for, from such electroweak constraints on the standard model, or from the standard model. And um, from time to time, some deviations between standard model and experiment are found. And they could be explained by such operators or by fundamental new physics, which gives rise to such an operator with some predictable coefficient. So anyway, this is an example where custodial symmetry can be violated. And I told you already that models, fundamental theories like Higgs triplet models would produce such an effect. But um, I wanted to say also something else. So I would stop the custodial discussion here. And the last item I wanted to do is on Higgs boson couplings, because that is also something for the future. The experiments at the Large Hadron Collider are, of course, very strongly after um, precision measurements of Higgs properties and Higgs couplings. And there is a lot of room, actually, still for deviations from the standard model. And let us look at corresponding operators. So let us imagine the Lagrangian contains, on the one hand, let's say lambda 6 times h dagger h cubed. That would essentially a Higgs to the 6 term in the Higgs potential. So it modifies the shape of the Mexican head potential. And let us also write down y6. 6 stands for dimension 6 operator. L bar h. ER times H dagger H. This is a dimension six operator. Here you have the ordinary Yukawa interaction, which normally gives mass to the lepton. And here I multiply with H dagger H on top of it. And what is the impact of both operators? They uh, change, of course, the Lagrangian, but they have a direct impact on Higgs properties and Higgs coupling measurements. So for example, uh, this changes the ratio between the Higgs mass and triple Higgs coupling. You know, so if you replace Higgs by, let's say, simply put um, small Higgs plus V, so in a very simple uh, hand-waving calculation, um, small Higgs would be the actual Higgs degree of freedom, the Higgs boson that we see experimentally, and V is the vacuum expectation value. And if you plug that in, you get H plus V to the sixth power, would, and you would get, for example, V to the four times H square plus V cube times H cube times some coefficient 
what is the coefficient of v to the four times h square? Um, that is something like six over two, probably, and that is six over three. And uh, whereas, if you have the normal Mexican head potential, you get v square times h square plus v, uh, v times h cube. Okay, and then here you get just um, four plus uh, whatever, four over two plus four over one, whatever that may be. And what I want to tell you with these um, considerations is this effectively becomes the Higgs boson mass and this becomes effectively the triple Higgs boson self-coupling. That is already measured and that is hopefully measured in the future. If the Mexican head potential comes from Higgs to the four, then the ratio between the mass and the triple Higgs coupling is the ratio between these two numbers. I think this is six and that is four. So the ratio is six over four. If the Higgs potential comes from Higgs to the six, then the ratio between the mass and the triple Higgs coupling is the ratio between these numbers, which is totally different. And so that means there is room that if you measure the triple Higgs coupling, even although we already know the Higgs mass, the triple Higgs coupling could go either way. So there is a lot of room for measurements which deviate strongly from the standard model prediction coming from such uh, dimension six operators. And that is a very interesting prospect. And here the same thing happens for the mass. So if you replace uh, this in that way, then uh, the mass of the lepton is given by y6 times v cube. That would become the mass of the lepton from this mass term here. But the coupling to the Higgs of the, the lepton coupling to the Higgs comes from the term um, h plus v cube becomes something like v cube plus three times h v square plus and so on. So the coupling to the Higgs would be three times y six times v square. And the factor three is the new prediction in the standard model. The ratio between the mass and the coupling is just the vacuum expectation value. And here it would be three times the expectation value. So in other words, once you measure the coupling of the lepton to the Higgs, according to this theory, it should be three times larger than the standard model prediction. So again, there is a lot of room for measurements which show strong deviations from the standard model prediction if such uh, interesting operators are there. And these measurements are ongoing. And um, if there is new physics, then generically new physics should uh, give contributions to such operators. They, they are not constrained by particular symmetries and therefore the coefficients of these operators could really be naively like one over lambda square and then we should have some um, potential observations um, at Higgs coupling measurements, both Higgs self couplings and Higgs couplings to fermions. Even though that is ongoing, you might have seen uh, this famous plot where you see the masses and the couplings to the Higgs and they basically perfectly line up on this ratio. So, so far all measurements of all couplings of any particle to the Higgs follows the pattern of this exact proportionality, whereas here we would predict a factor three deviation. And so this is more plausible for the light particles than it is for the heavy particles where the standard model predicts extremely small effects because the couplings are small, so corrections from new physics could be relatively large. And therefore it is important and very interesting to do those measurements for the electron, for example, for the down quark and so on. That is not yet done at all. And we will see what we get. Um, I think it is actually not totally unplausible that the first generation and or the first two generations receive their masses by a different mechanism from the third generation, which would explain also why the masses are so much lighter. And if the mechanism is different, we could easily see 
um, or hope for such deviations, which can be described by, for example, such operators. All right, having said that, I think our semester has come to an end, and uh, I can only thank you for your attention and hope that you got something out of this lecture and uh, wish you all the best for your future in or outside uh, physics or elementary particle physics and um, see you soon elsewhere and all the best for the vacation time. <laughs>